So at this point, you've probably already noticed that usually I tend to focus on goofy examples. Like I had a video taken down by YouTube because I included too much of a clip from the office in it and I had to edit that down to avoid a copyright strike. But when you understand statistics, you have this like superpower that can help you navigate the news and the real world and I think I need to do a video about that. So I grew up in the 90s and the internet was always presented as this thing that was going to like open up all these doors. It was going to make everyone connected and everyone would be so smart and know everything. I mean, we simultaneously thought that like the world was going to end on Y2K and like I owned this book. Um, but we also thought at the same time that the internet was going to be this amazing tool that we would all use to, you know, improve our intelligence and connect with people across the world and it was going to make the world a better place. Yeah, that didn't happen, like even close. <laughs> if anything, it's made us less intelligent less connected, more divided, and honestly just not that healthy. And one thing that the internet has, I think, exploited is the fact that an image is worth a thousand words. Research has shown that people are more likely to remember images than text, so the images we choose to illustrate our stories are very influential. Now there are plenty of examples of different media outlets using the same image to convey two different messages. That's not really what I want to focus on in this video. What I want to focus on is using different images to present one issue in two different ways. For example, immigration. Now the activity we're going to do focuses on um, migrants in the EU and it actually comes from a fantastic website called Skew the Script, but most of what we're talking about you can see in the United States as well. The way we talk about immigrants and the way we show images of immigrants can change people's minds. And I know the fact that I just said immigration means you're going to think that this is a super political video. It's really not, because it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. If you're getting your news from an extremely conservative source or an extremely liberal source or anywhere in between, it is so important to know that that source is trying to influence the way you think about the news. So I'm not trying to convince you to be on either side of the spectrum. I'm trying to convince you to think critically about where your news comes from, whether that's liberal or conservative or what you think is neutral. I just want you to be mindful of the fact that people are trying to manipulate you, but you don't have to be manipulated because you have statistics and you know how to look at the data without being tricked. You also know how to read, so I'm not going to read all this to you. What I'd like you to do is pause the video and read these first three paragraphs so you understand what we're going to be doing in this video. Okay, I know it seems silly to use mock data, but this is the first confidence interval that we've ever really done together, and it's going to be a little bit easier if the numbers are smaller, and then I'll show you some actual data after we do this sort of fake scenario. So we have a random sample of 34 immigrants in Madrid, and of those, 15 are male. So that's 44%, and since that came from a sample, I'm calling that p-hat. In bold is what we're supposed to do. Estimate the true proportion of Madrid's recent immigrants who identify as male with 95% confidence. So we'll start this the same way we started the book example. We want to think about the sampling distribution of p hat. So once again, sampling distribution, this would be taking every possible sample of size 34 and calculating the proportion of males in all of those samples. Obviously unrealistic, so we're doing an approximate sampling distribution here. We're imagining what it would look like. Now the first thing we need to note is that this was a random sample. If our sample isn't randomly selected, it doesn't really represent the population well. If it's the first 34 people to register on any particular day, there might be some lurking variable that affects whether or not they are male or female. Um, so it's really important that our sample is random, and we have that here. Now you'll notice that I've drawn a normal distribution. We know that this distribution is normal because NP and N1 minus P are both greater than 10. Now I don't actually know what p is, that's the whole point of this, is to estimate the true proportion. So I'm just using p hat instead of p. And that's totally valid when you're doing a confidence interval. So n p hat is 15, n 1 minus p hat is 19, both of those are greater than 10, and we saw in the last unit that if that is true, the sampling distribution of p hat is approximately normal. Now I have labeled the center of this distribution at 0.44 because that was our p hat. We don't know what the true proportion is, we're trying to estimate it. So we're using 0.44 as our point estimate. Um, so we're going to say that the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat is 0.44. So 
So far we've described the shape and the center. We also need to check out the variability. Now it's been a while, but in the last unit we saw that to use the standard deviation formula for any sampling distribution, you have to have independence or you have to check the 10% rule. So I would say it's safe to assume independence here because there are more than 340 migrants in Spain. So we can use the formula for standard deviation. Now if we check the formula sheet, in the last unit when we dealt with sampling distributions of p hat, we used this formula. But we don't know what p is. The whole point of this problem is to estimate it. So we're going to use p hat in place of p. It's the exact same formula, but we're using p hat, which makes this the standard error instead of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So we will refer to it as s p hat instead of sigma p hat, and we're using p hat instead of p. So I've plugged all that in here. The standard error is 0 0.0851, and that describes the variability. That is not a very big spread. So, so far I haven't actually calculated the interval. I've just made sure that everything we're about to do is okay. Now, in the book example, we did two times the standard deviation, and we added that and we subtracted that from our point estimate. In the book example, it was x bar, but here we're dealing with p hat. That too came from the empirical rule, which said that 95% of the data in a normal distribution is within two standard deviations of the mean. But you may remember me clarifying when we did normal distributions, the empirical rule is an estimate. So about 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. So we could keep doing two times the standard deviation and add and subtract that, but I'd like to be more accurate than about 95%. So let's think about the normal distribution. We want to have 95% of the data in the middle of the distribution. That would leave 0.025 in each tail. Now once again, in the book example, we just said, oh, well, this z-score here is 2. But let's figure out what it actually is. Remember that if you know the area under the curve, there is a thing you can do on the calculator to find a z-score. That's right, inverse norm. Now you've noticed I've put a star here, maybe. Um, we call this z star the critical value, and to find it we do inverse norm. Now I'm just putting in point 0 0.025, so really I'm finding this z star, but remember that um, the normal distribution is symmetric, so I'm going to get a negative z score, it's just going to be the positive version over here. So I'm doing point 0.025, mean is 0, standard deviation is 1, because this is the standard normal distribution, and I get negative 1.96. So we know that this one is going to be positive 1.96. So that's very close to 2. 2 wasn't a bad estimate. It's pretty close. Um, but this is going to be more accurate. This is actually 95% of the data instead of about 95% of the data. So now we can do what we did in the last video. We take our estimate, which in this case is p hat. We're going to do plus or minus. So we're going to add and subtract. Last time we did 2 times the standard deviation, but this time we'll do 1.96 times the standard deviation. And that standard deviation, we're actually doing the standard error because we don't know the true standard deviation. So I've written out the whole formula, and here it is again with numbers, and that gets us this interval, 0.2732 up to 0 0.6068. What this means is we are 95% confident that the true proportion of male migrants in Spain is between 0.2732 and 0 0.6068. Remember, this doesn't mean that there's a 95% chance that we've captured the true mean. We've either captured it or we haven't. There's two outcomes. The probability of getting it is either 1 or 0. What the 95% means is if we were to do this many, 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 many times, we would capture the true mean in about 95% of those intervals. So maybe we caught it here, maybe we didn't. Hopefully we did. Um, I just want to point out I was color coding things here for a reason. When you are asked to estimate the true proportion of something, whether the problem says it or not, you need to use the four-step process, just like we've done in previous units. The reason we have to do the four-step process is it's going to help us not miss anything. Once again, the four-step process is state, plan, do, conclude. Now the state step they basically did for us. Um, all you want to say for state is what you want to find. So estimate the true proportion of Madrid's recent immigrants who identify as male with 95% confidence. Literally all you should write for the state step. Make sure that when you're stating you always have context. You don't just want to say the true proportion, you want to say the true proportion of and then say what the problem is about. Everything you see here in purple is the plan step. Now there are three conditions you have to check when you plan. 
We did all three here. The first condition is you have to make sure that it is a random sample, and that's usually stated in the problem. If it's not, you can say, we'll have to assume it's random, unless it's blatantly obvious that it's not. The second condition we have to check is if the distribution is normal. Clearly, we're going to need a normal distribution to do the do step. Um, so that is one of the conditions we have to check. And then the last condition we have to check is independence, or the 10% rule. And that's because we're going to have to use this formula, and you can't use the formula unless you have independence. So those are the three conditions. You can do them in any order you'd like. If you find that one of the conditions isn't met, you don't do the rest of the problem. You would just write, unfortunately, the distribution is not normal, so we cannot continue. I know, your fingers are crossed, hoping that that happens. It does happen sometimes. Technically, this isn't part of plan, but I would also draw a quick diagram just to jog your memory and make sure that you're on the right track. Okay, here's the do step. This is where you actually calculate the interval. And this is an AP class, so the College Board does run my life. Um, it is important that you show formulas in the do step, so that's why I wrote this out. You're just proving that you know what you're doing. You're showing you that you know which formula to use and what to plug in for everything. Just do what they say. And then here's conclude. You will notice I wrote context with several exclamation points because you must have context in your conclusion. The actual conclusion is basically a Mad Lib. You'll say we are blank percent confident that the true blank is between blank and blank. You can do it the same every single time. You do not have to come up with creative ways to write this sentence. In fact, it's just easier if you use this sentence structure. Don't try to get fancy and make up different ways of explaining things because odds are you'll say something wrong. But the main thing in the conclusion is make sure there's context. It shouldn't be a generic conclusion that could apply to any problem. It should be specifically about this problem, so male migrants in Spain. Okay, so now we can actually answer the question. Use the interval to evaluate the validity of the claim that 60% of immigrants are male. Take a moment and pause the video and see if you can answer this question yourself. All right, 60% is included in that interval, so it is possible that the true proportion of males is equal to 0.6. What we stated in this problem was that we're 95% confident that the true proportion is somewhere here, between 27% and 60.68%. So 60% is there. Barely, but it's there. It's included in the interval, so it is possible. However, it's a pretty large interval, all the way from 27% to 60.6%, and that 60% is just barely included, so we should maybe be a bit cautious. But what we saw in that video is that it is plausible that the proportion of migrants who are male is 60%. So now that we've done the mock data, let's see the actual survey. So researchers randomly selected 583 immigrants from the registrations, and what do you know, 44% were male. It's almost like that mock data was created on purpose to match. All right, this is the same proportion as before, but a much higher sample size. So is that claim that 60% of immigrants are male still plausible? What I'd like you to do is skip the state and the plan steps, calculate the new standard deviation for this new scenario, and then recalculate the interval. Do that and then try to answer this question about the claim one more time. So the new standard deviation is 0.0206. This time we've divided by 583 instead of 34, so clearly a much smaller standard deviation, or standard error I should say. So then we take our original calculation and all we're doing is instead of 0.0851, we're putting in 0.0206. Our new interval, we are 95% confident that the true proportion of migrants who are male in Spain is between 0.3996 and 0.4804. So this time that claim that 60% of migrants are male is not plausible because 60% is well outside of the interval. So the increased sample size has decreased the variability, which has made our interval narrower. Because 60% is not included in the interval, it is not a plausible value for P. Based on this particular sample, it looks like the proportion of migrants who are male is below 50%, so less than half, because the upper limit of this interval is only 48%. So in terms of statistics, what did we learn? How to do confidence intervals for proportions. Probably more important, knowing statistics can help you avoid being manipulated by news sources and also just by internet trolls. When you read a news article from any source, it could be liberal, conservative, it could be a post on Reddit, 
Think about where the content is coming from. Think about why they might be trying to influence you. And then you have the tools to investigate to see if they're telling you the truth, which means you can think critically about when you're being manipulated and you can investigate issues to decide what's fact and what's fiction.